Wasn't that a great story? It's how it begins for a lot of us. You know, somewhere along the way, someone invites. And, you know, who would have guessed? I'm sure Danny wouldn't have. Some time back in 03, 04, 05, whenever it was, that he got invited here, of all places. That invitation would end up creating uh, an effect that would, that would, in many ways, alter his family tree, right? Uh, that he would end up in high school, accepting Christ, have a call to ministry. He would come back to serve this church, that his family would connect here, that his brother, Mondo, give us a wave, man. There he is. <laughs> that he would place his faith in Christ, that, that, that his brother would baptize him here in the baptistry, right, on a Wednesday night. And it, and it started with a simple invitation. Uh, today, when you leave, you may have already picked them up. We're going to ask you to grab some invites for Easter. Uh, it's going to come up in three Sundays. We're back at the convention center. Last year, we said, bring somebody with you because we'll have a seat for them. Well, we lied. We didn't have a seat for them. <laughs> we had 2,800 seats and somewhere around 3,400 people. I don't know exactly how many chairs we're going to have this year, but you know what I hope? I hope we don't have enough for them again. Bring, bring someone with you. You'll get, you'll get a bag. You'll notice there are three cards um, I know this, this seems self-explanatory, but uh, by definition, it's an invite, so that means you give it away, don't keep it, right? There's some bracelets. You could put a bracelet on your wrist, give those away, but, but April 1st, Easter Sunday, McAllen Convention Center refused to come alone that day. Bring somebody from work, your family, your neighborhood, meet somebody between now and then, invite, you know, here's a surefire way to make sure somebody comes with you, invite a whole bunch of people. You invite a whole bunch of people, like just odds are someone's going to show up, right? So that's coming up. We're excited about that. We are hitting the pause button today, um, as Nidia said, on our Kingdom Come series as we jump into a mini-series called B1. It'll be three weeks long. Easter Sunday will be here, and then the Sunday after Easter we will jump back into uh, Kingdom Come. So what we're going to be doing is talking about this challenge that I issued at the beginning of the year, uh, and I call it the B1 Challenge. Uh, I'm taking it personally. I'm asking everyone who calls BT their home to take it personally. There's three parts to the B1 challenge. The first one is this, that in 2018, uh, you would commit to being one person fully surrendered to Jesus. One person fully committed. That doesn't mean that you're perfect. Right? Be, being one, I want to be clear, being one is not being a perfect one. What does being one mean? It means that you press into Jesus and you pursue Jesus. You, you, you mark time out of your day to spend with him. Being one means that you're not going to be casual with your sin. You cannot be fully surrendered to Jesus and be casual with your sin. You cannot have pet sins and be sold out for God. So be one. The second thing is bring one. Part of that is in a few weeks. I'm asking everyone to bring someone to Easter. But there's a deeper part to it. We're also asking everyone who calls BT their home church this year to bring someone to faith in Christ. Now let me be clear. No one in this room, no one in overflow in the atrium or lobby areas, no one online, no one can save anyone outside of Jesus. But, but you can tell someone. And what I believe is if you'll commit this year to seeing one person, that's two, one. If you'll commit to seeing one person trust Jesus as their Savior, it's going to happen. You, you, you share faith with someone, they say, no, by the way, keep sharing, don't stop. You go to somebody else. If, if you set in your heart, if you know Christ as your Savior, and you set in your heart to say, this year I'm going to see someone get saved, I promise it's going to happen. So bring one to faith in Christ, and the last component of the challenge is build one. That at some point in time this year, you would take time to build somebody to maturity in Christ. Now, here's the deal about building someone to maturity in Christ. It's not a one-time fix. It's a, it's a continual process. But what I'm saying is that you'll commit to locking arms with someone to see them grow in their faith. Now, here's the deal. I want to clarify this because sometimes uh, we don't get this. Uh, if you're a parent or maybe you're a grandparent, you have some, or an aunt or an uncle, uh, but I'll just talk to the parents. If you have a teenager or a preteen, you got an eight-year-old that just trusted Jesus, maybe you got an adult child that just trusted Jesus. If you're a parent, building your child, your son or daughter to spiritual maturity counts. You don't have to go find someone at work. If you, you could start in your home. In fact, if some of us would start in our home this year and grab our kids or our grandkids or our nieces and nephews and try to build them to maturity in Christ, that would be amazing. But be one person fully surrendered to Jesus, bring one person to faith in Jesus, and build one person to maturity in faith 
in Christ. And that's what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about what does it mean to be one. What does it mean to be a person who is fully surrendered? Not perfect, but committed to pursuing Jesus, being sold out. And so today we're going to look at a text in the book of Ezekiel. We, we haven't been there in ever, so this will be new. So grab your Bible and open to the middle, and you'll probably find something like Job or Psalms or Proverbs. If that's what you find, keep turning to the, le- to the right, like flipping this way, whatever way. Keep turning. You're going to hit like uh, Jeremiah. Keep going. You're going to hit Lamentations. Take a moment to lament. Uh, and then keep going, and you're going to hit, but it, don't go too fast because Lamentations is short. Then you're going to hit Ezekiel, all right? Ezekiel 22. So why don't you turn there while you do that? Why don't you say hi to somebody next to you? And uh, why don't you also check in on Facebook and tell people you love the book of Ezekiel, all right? Oh, you're about to. All right. Ezekiel 22, Old Testament prophet here. We're going to start in verse 23. This is what it says today. The word of the Lord came to me. Now, this is Ezekiel speaking. He's a prophet, which means he's a mouthpiece for God. He's a messenger. So he's getting a message. He's about to give it. So the words we're about to read are God's words for the people of Judah, the nation of Judah. All right? So what he says, verse 24, Son of man, say to her, you are a land that has not been cleansed, that has not received rain in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets within her is like a roaring lion tearing its prey. They devour people, seize wealth and valuables, and multiply the widows within her. Her priests do violence to my instruction and profane my holy things. They make no distinction between the holy and the common, and they do not explain the difference between the clean and the unclean. They close their eyes to my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Isn't this a feel-good passage already? I mean, you know, you're dirty, and your prophets are losers, basically. And there's more widows being like that, like that's feel like more widows are being created. And there's no distinction. And, and then that last part, right? And I am profaned among them. Like that's a coffee mug verse right there, right? Like what am I going to drink out of today? Be still and know that I am God or I am profaned among them. I don't know. Anyways, verse 27. Her officials within her are like wolves tearing their prey, shedding blood and destroying lives in order to make profit dishonestly. Her prophets plaster for them with whitewash by seeing false visions and lying divination, saying this is what the Lord God says, when the Lord God has not spoken. The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and unlawfully exploited the resident alien. Check out verse 30. I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy, but I found no one. So I have poured out my indignation on them and consumed them with the fire of my fury. I have brought their conduct down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we spend these next few moments in your word, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive from you. God, help us understand what it means today to be one. God, to pursue you first and foremost, to to give all of our affection and all of our allegiance to you. And God, I pray today you would bring to light the things that maybe rob us you of your right place. God, give us the conviction to repent of sin today. God, restore hope to hopeless situations. God, today, glorify yourself as you call men and women to your side. May today be the day of salvation for your glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, here's the deal. I admit that's a, that's a pretty whack passage right there, right? Like what? How are we going to talk about being one? Before I really jump in, I want to do a little bit of historical background just because I think it's important. Some of us may have all the knowledge about Ezekiel and what was happening. Some of us, maybe that's the first time you've ever read anything from the book of Ezekiel. So let me do a a real quick history background. Most of us are familiar with the fact that there was a, well, there is, but there was a nation of Israel in the Old Testament, right? You with me? There's this nation of Israel, right? They, they formed, they originally, as they, they, they were descendants of this guy Jacob who had his name changed to Israel. He had like a mess of kids, like a litter of sons. He had 12 of them. And they had kids. And so these 12 sons create tribes, basically. And so the, 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 the descendants of, of Jacob, whose name becomes Israel, they end up going to Egypt. They end up becoming slaves in Egypt, about 2 million of them. 
That's when Moses comes on the scene, right? Remember Moses? Moses leads them out of slavery. The nation of Israel kind of wanders in the desert a little bit. And then they end up going to what's called the promised land, and they set up shop. And for a season, the nation of Israel, again, two million plus people, they are li- living, they're being governed by some judges, but ultimately God is their ruler. But then one day, the nation of Israel goes to God, and they basically do this number. God, we, we really want a king, God. You know, kind of whiny voice, kicking the foot, right? God says, you don't need a king. I'm your king. They say, yeah, but, but, but God, Assyria, they've got a people king. Like, he's a real man with, a, like, a beard, and I could poke him. And I, I, can't, I can't poke you. And ultimately, that's not exactly how it goes, but anyways. Ultimately, God says, all right, you want a king? I'll give you a king. So the nation of Israel gets a guy named Saul to be king. That doesn't go very good. So then they get a second king. Now, you probably heard of this guy. This guy's name is David, right? You with me? Nod your head. You heard of David, right? Little guy fights the big guy, right? And, and so more happens in his life, though. After the little guy beats the big guy, uh, a few years down the road, he becomes king of the smattering of yeah, Israel. Yeah, Israel. He be like... What, do you think I'm messing with you? He becomes the king of Babylon. No, he becomes the king of Israel. And it's a great time. He's the king for 40 years, and Israel becomes legit. They are like the world power. They, they conquer lands. They expand. Things are going well. David reigns for 40 years. He dies. His son Solomon assumes the throne. Now, Solomon had some flaws like all of us, but he was wise. He led Israel through a time of affluence, Right? Uh, David was influenced. There was the sword. Solomon was affluence. There was peace. He built the temple. It was good. But after Solomon, things changed. Solomon's son assumes the throne. And during that reign, the one kingdom of Israel became two. You see, it splits. So now you've got a kingdom in the north called Israel. They got the naming rights, okay? And then you've got a kingdom in the south called Judah. They got the capital, Jerusalem, right? So you got the ten tribes in the north, two in the south, Israel and Judah. You with me? Two separate kingdoms, two separate kings. Things go on. After a little while, the northern kingdom is conquered. In 722 B.C., the Neo-Assyrian Empire would come in and conquer Israel, and they are no longer an independent nation, free state. They are conquered. They've lost their identity. About 150 years would go by. Judah's still rocking along in the south, doing their thing, making fun of Israel in the north. Oh, yeah, you guys got cocky. But about 150 years later, in 586 B.C., Judah, the the kingdom of Judah, the nation of Judah, would be conquered by the Neo-Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar. And they would lose their national identity. And when that happened, many of the Israelites in Judah, many of the citizens of Judah were taken into captivity. One of those dudes taken captive was a priest named Ezekiel. Ding, 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 right? So Ezekiel's a priest. That means that he's, he goes to God on behalf of the people, but he gets another job. He becomes a prophet, which means he becomes a mouthpiece or messenger for God to the people. Now, Ezekiel's a difficult book. More than any prophetic book in the Old Testament, it deals with visions. It's, it's, it can be difficult to understand. The bulk of Ezekiel's book, by the way, if you're familiar with Jeremiah, they're contemporaries. And so because Jeremiah is the weeping prophet, he's sad. Ezekiel seems kind of sad and harsh. He has a hopeful pronouncement, but many times it's followed by a harsh reality. And what's happening here in Ezekiel 22, verses 23 through 29, is God is speaking through him, telling the people, you are messed up. That's what happens. All those verses that sound kind of weird, what is happening is God is saying, there is no one, I can't find anyone who is righteous. What what God does in verses 23 through 29 is he, he covers all segments of society. He says the royalties, the princes, are debased and immoral. He says the priests are selfish and immoral. He he says the prophets, they're false prophets. They lie about visions. They're selfish and immoral. He says the officials, the politicians, right? The politicians are selfish and immoral. And because it's filtering down the princes, the priests, the prophets, and the politicians, guess what? So are the people. He says the people extort each other. They rob each other. And so he's, he's giving a statement of fact about the condition of the nation or the people of Judah. And he says that, that you are lost in sin. You are hopeless and you are spiritually bankrupt. And in verse 30, there's this hopeful pronouncement 
where God says, I searched for a man among them who would rebuild the wall and stand in the gap before me, hopeful pronouncement, so that I might not destroy the land. But then harsh reality, but I found no one. So my indignation, the fire of my fury will be poured out upon them. This is the declaration of the Lord God. So how in the world does that that passage, predominantly verse 30, how does it communicate to us how we can be one, sold out, surrendered for Jesus? There's a few things. Here's the first thing that we see specifically looking at verse 30. How many people was God looking for? One. Right? Here's the deal. God was looking for one. He was looking for one here in the text. He's looking for one today. He makes it clear. He said, I searched for a man among them, dot, 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 to stand, rebuild the wall, stand in the gap so I wouldn't destroy the land, but I found no one. God was searching for one. Now, people say, hold on, what about Ezekiel? Ezekiel was the prophet. Remember, he's the mouthpiece. So think of him like the narrator in the story, right? God's looking for someone else, okay? He says, I'm looking for one. Let me ask you a really tricky question. How many are you? Good. How many am I? How many was God looking for? Let me tell you, the, the, the message today is going to be extremely personal. God was looking for one. How many did he find? None. God found none. I remember I was in college the first time that I came across this verse. I went to a Christian school. Uh, part of being there, regardless of your major, you could be education, business, Bible. You had to take Old and New Testament. And so for the first time, I'm in class, Old Testament, my first semester. I did all of my homework and reading because it was my first semester. I thought you had to. <laughs> Anyways, um, you do have to, college students. Anyways, um, and I remember what we, we read the entire Old Testament. And I remember sitting in my dorm room reading Ezekiel, I think it was like chapters 20 through, I don't know, 20, I don't remember, what, but I read 22. I wasn't even a believer yet. I was familiar with the things of God, but I remember reading verse 30, and it, it, it grabbed my heart. Beloved, that is a heart-wrenching statement. You may be familiar in, early in the Old Testament where, where God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, these two debased, immoral cities. And, and let me say this, by the way, because there may be someone listening online, someone in the room, and you may be thinking, man, like, God's going to, he's going to, like, pour out his indignation. That's like hardcore. He's, he's going to destroy the people of Judah. He, he wiped out Sodom and Gomorrah. That seems harsh. Well, here's my encouraging word. When you become God, you can do it different. You should probably stop applying for his job, though. Anyways, it will never become open. So, but here's the deal. Sodom and Gomorrah, they are spiritually bankrupt cities, and God says, I'm going to wipe them out. And there's this conversation with some of God's followers, like, no, don't do that. And God says, if you can find me some righteous people, and they kind of go back and forth, ultimately they land on the number 10. If you could find 10 righteous people, and they couldn't find 10 in the two cities, well, here God's not looking for 10. He's looking for how many? And he didn't find one. The entire fallen nation of Judah. All the captives. He did not find one. Beloved, let me, let me be clear about something. There are, pl there are plenty of nuns today. I don't mean Catholic ladies in uniform. N-O-N-E-S. There are plenty of nuns today. You know what God needs? He needs some ones. If we're serious about making a dent in the lostness of the Rio Grande Valley, what do I mean by lostness? People who do not know Jesus at this moment, and if they left the earth today, they would spend eternity in hell apart from him. That is not popular to preach, but it is biblical to preach. Stats tell us that the state of Texas has 18 million lost people. That at this moment in our state, there are 18 million people who do not know Jesus. I do not know the number for the Rio Grande Valley. I do know the valley is the most unreached area of the state. Unchurched area of the state. So just take a stab at it. There's a bunch. And if we're going to make a dent in that lostness, and you know, some people are like, oh, you're, you're kind of getting number heavy. You, you better believe I'm getting numbers heavy right now. I am concerned about the lost people of our community. 
because God's concerned about him. Because one day people were concerned about my lostness and God was concerned about my lostness. I, I want to be clear. We talk about things like, you know, Easter at the convention center and we talk about bringing, you know, bring a friend week every week and we want to fill this room and, and we, we open Sherryland and we want to open more campuses and plant more churches and it is scary and there's a lot of unknowns and, and, and people, you know, I've just decided that I cannot explain away. I cannot, I, I want to be clear, but I cannot explain away what's in my heart and why I want to do this and by default some people people will think that, that I or we are trying to make it about BT. We are trying to see lost people saved. That's what we're trying to do. But if we are going to make a dent in the lostness of the valley, it will require someone to be one. It will require someone to say, I am no longer content to go to work, to go to my neighborhood, to look at my family, to go to school, to go to my community and know that the majority of people are on a crash course with hell. You see, this miniseries, B1, at its core, it, it is evangelistic in nature. It's about reaching people. So the question that we have to ask, looking at the text here, God says, I searched for someone, I found a bunch of nuns. And so, beloved, how, how do we move from being a nun to a one? How do I be a one instead of a nun? How do I become that person that God is searching for, like Isaiah, in, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, where God says, who are we going to send? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. How will we become that person? Here's a few things quickly. If you want to be one, and I mean really you want to be sold out, not perfect, but committed. You want to do battle with your sin. Again, you cannot be one and keep casual sin. John Owens is an old dead guy. I like to quote old dead guys. John Owens says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you, right? So you want to fight your sin. You want to love the Lord. You want to press into that. Here are a few things that can position you and I to be one who stands in the gap. And here's the first one. You want to be one, you need to stir up your love and affection for God. If you want to be one, you need to stir up your love and affection for God. I just said that these next few weeks, at the core of this series, it's about reaching people. But, but here's, the, here's the, uh, the, the trick statement. Reaching people is not first and foremost about people. Reaching people first and foremost is about God. We've got to have a love for God before we can have a love for people. We've got to stir up our affections. And, you know, people say, well, I don't really know what that means. I don't feel like it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad someone said that. Let me, let me talk about that for a minute. In 1997, I met my wife, Christy. We became friends. We communicated back and forth for the next several years. In December of 2000, I made a decision, and I asked her. My decision was that I would fulfill all of her wildest dreams by asking her out. <laughs> Not a joke. No. No, I, in, in December of 2000, I decided I would ask her out on a date. Okay, why? Well, I knew her and I enjoyed her company. Let's, you know, we, we want to make it everything, we want to make everything, you know, spiritual. And, but here, I was physically attracted to her, okay? And so based on the things I knew, I said, I'm going to do this. And so for the next six months, I asked her on more dates. And then after six months, I, I upped the ante and I asked her to marry me. And for the next year, we were engaged. And, and then June 1st of 2002, this coming June will be 16 years, June 1st, 2002, we made a decision to get married. And we, you got to clap if you're going to do it. I got a long sermon today. And here's the deal. For 16 years, there's been a lot of choices that I've had to make. I know that for, for the married people in the room, this is not true for you because you have mastered marriage, but Christy and I were still working on it. And you know what? There are some days that I get on her nerves. I know, right? There is a converse reciprocal statement to that that I'm not going to say out loud. Those are big words that, you know. There, there are some days that we don't agree. And let, let me be clear about something. If I only relied on my feelings, and they're important. I'm, don't, don't get me, your feel, you should feel love. But if I, I, I'm not exact, if I only relied on my feelings for her, 
it's very possible I would not be married today because sometimes I have to tell my feelings to take a back seat and I have to decide to stir up my affection for her. It is primarily a choice. You choose it enough, the feelings match. And so people say, well, I don't know how to love God more. Yes, you do. You know how to love your football team. You know how to love your job, your money, your kids. You know how to love. You want to be one, it will begin by stirring up some affections and some feelings and some, some, not, some, some affections and some love for God by choosing to do so. If you do not stir up your affection for God, you will never be one for God. This works for the next week. Next week's a bring one. Well, you know, I really want to share my faith. I really want to bring one, but I'm just not feeling it. I like what John Piper said. He says, if you struggle with feeling what you need to feel towards someone to tell them about Jesus, just focus on what you feel about God. If you don't think you, which is really silly, but if you don't think you can love someone enough to tell them about Jesus, you should love Jesus enough to tell them about him anyways. We've got to stir up some affection. We, we've got to move, well, I just don't feel like, I don't care. Well, I feel overlooked. That shouldn't happen. Well, I don't want to speak up at work because I, I feel mistreated. I, 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 am, I am genuinely sorry. But those external realities should be separated from the internal reality of Jesus in your heart if you've received him. And if you've received him, you should be able to stir up some affection for him. The truth is, instead of being a bunch of nuns for God, again, not Catholic women, we should be a bunch of knots for God. You're like, say what? I'm glad you asked. Being a knot for God, it's a statement that I began to use a little bit when I was in youth ministry, and this is where I got it. You see, in Genesis chapter 5, it's this amazing, riveting passage. The subtitle is The Line of Seth, right? Ooh. Okay, you missed it. So anyways... um, See, Seth was the third son of Adam and Eve, Cain, Abel, Seth. And the the fifth chapter of Genesis is literally his family tree. This is the stuff preachers long to preach. Like, man, what am I preaching this week? I hope it's Genesis 5. Let let me give you a sample, right? Um, Genesis 5, 15. Mahalalel was 65 years old when he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived 830 years after he fathered Jared, and then he fathered other sons and daughters. So Mahalalel's life lasted 895 years, then he died. Like, who doesn't want to preach that verse? That's the chapter. So-and-so lived this long, had this kid, had more kids, died. Pick up with the kid. This kid lived, right? That's how it goes, but it gets interesting because in verse 21, it says, Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. By the way, any expecting parents, we need to bring that name back. You got a son on the way? (laughs) Methuselah is the way to go. You can call him Meth for short. (laughs) That one just came to me. That, that's one of those probably shouldn't have said, but anyways. <laughs> and after he fathered Methuselah, a.k.a. Meth, Enoch, check, this is where it gets different. Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. You could read all of Genesis chapter 5. This dude had this kid and, and lived this long and died. This is the only place where the script changes. It says he, he, he fathered Methuselah, and then he walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Now, if you just stop there, it's like, what happened to Enoch? I mean, Mahalalel was like 850, and, and his son Methuselah lives to be like 1,000. All these people have crazy long lifespans, but yet Enoch, it says his life lasted 365 years. Well, look at verse 24. Enoch walked with God, then he was not there, because God took him. And you know what? That's, 
That is all the Bible really says about him. There's a few other lineages, family trees, where Enoch is mentioned. In the book of Jude and the New Testament, he's quoted. All right, so you get this. This kind of gets repeated in a, in a few other places. Jude, he gets quoted. The only other place he's mentioned, check this out, is Hebrews chapter 11. If you're not familiar, Hebrews chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith, right? Like Hall of Fame, but for faithful people. And I mean, they, they list the big dogs like Abraham. Abraham takes up like a third of the book of Genesis, He's mentioned all over the place. That dude got a song named after him, Father Abraham. I mean, that's, those are the people. Those are the people in Hebrews 11. But guess who else is in the mix? Enoch. You read Hebrews, and consider Enoch, who walked with God and was taken up. That's all the Bible says about the dude. But here's what we know. There's only two people ever that have not died Enoch and Elijah. Again, Elijah got a whole bunch of Bible text about him. He's taken up in a whirlwind. I don't know how Enoch went. I like to picture him walking to town with one of his buddies, and he's just not there. You know, he's like, he's walking with his, you know, he's, he's walking with his son, and then he's not there, and Methuselah's like, right, right, meth. Anyways, so, um, but, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. That's all we need to know about him. Was Enoch perfect? No way. He was born with a sin nature. But when all the Bible has to say about you is you walked with God in such a way that he decided just to take you home, that's all that needs to be said. I promise you Enoch was one. When God surveyed the land in Enoch's day, he didn't have to look hard. Let's be a not for God instead of a none for God. What does that mean? You may not ever be taken up. You may experience physical death. But what is at the core of being a not? Enoch walked with God and was not. We can walk with God also. And the fact is, the more we walk with God, the more it's about him and the less it's about us. John says it this way in chapter 3, verse 30. He's got to increase and I got to decrease. Let us stir up affections and love for God in such a way that we choose to press into him. We choose to get in the word. Well, I just can't wake up. I'm not even going to entertain that ridiculousness. Get in the word. Be in prayer. You can show up here on a Sunday and you can raise your hands in worship and you can amen the sermon and you can come forward at the invitation. But if you leave here and go back to your sins and you're not bothered by it and you go back to selfish lifestyle as a husband or a wife and you go back to ignoring God, guess what? What happens in here is the lie and who you are out there is the truth. You stir up your love for God, and you diminish while he increases. You know what's amazing, what I have found when I diminish? I I hope that, I I really, I don't ever pray, man, I hope today somebody criticizes me and takes advantage of me and mis. I don't ever pray that. Unfortunately, it happens. You know what's amazing, though? When I'm diminishing, it's not that I suddenly enjoy those things, it's that they have much less effect on me. Because it's about him. And he was mistreated. And this is not my home. And so even even when I may be oppressed, I can still choose to be one as my affections are stirred up for him. Second thing, you want to be one, you got to stir up your affections. Secondly, you got to stand up. God said, right, he said, I I looked for one to stand in the gap. Here's the reality. Stirred up affections for God, position us to serve God. Stirred up affections for God, position us to serve God. God was looking for someone to stand, to walk in obedience. That's what I'm getting at. To not just do lip service, right, but to walk in obedience. Here's the deal. When you, when you make the choice and you say, I'm going to be one and I'm going to stand for God, inevitably failure is a possibility, not on God's part, but our part. It is. When you choose to stand for God, falling down and failing is a possibility. You know, as we landscape the valley and we talk about things like campuses 
and church plants and this and that, a lot of things without a lot of certainty. It is unnerving. A year ago when we asked 60 people to leave here to go start Sherryland, didn't know what was going to happen as we look to other areas and, and, and we want to go uh, to other places to expand the gospel in the Rio Grande Valley. There are a lot of unknowns, but you can believe I would much rather fall down attempting to stand than just keep my seat. At some point in time, if you are going to be one, you will have to stand up, get out of the seat, take that step of obedience. James is clear, faith without works is dead. Active obedience. Again, you can do all you want in here. If your outside life doesn't match it, this is the mockery, not that. Husbands, if you can go back to work this week and re-engage in flirtatious relationships, guess what? This is the mockery. Fill in the blank with whatever it is. At some point in time, and, and this is serious business, you want to stand up and be one, you will have to put, put actions to your faith. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, and he, he gives us these amazing verses in verses 8 and 9. He says, For it is by grace through faith that you have been saved, and this is not from yourselves, it's God's gift. What, what does that mean? It means we, we can't do it. You, you Hear me. If you are here right now, if you're listening online, and you think, man, one day I'm pretty sure I'll get to heaven because I've done some awesome stuff, you are woefully mistaken. You are saved by grace through faith. Why is it that way? So that the next verse, you can't boast about it. This is not from works, so you can't boast about it. Amazing verses, and most people know 8 and 9 as they memorize Scripture, but what's amazing is the next verse. Paul tells us we're, we're saved by grace through faith, and we can't brag about it, and then he says this, for we are his workmanship, craftsmanship in some versions, masterpiece, Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Now, this is why we should be so eager to stand up. We are his workmanship. I know there are some fellas in this room, and you are like Mr. Fix-It, handyman, MacGyver. You can, you know, build an airplane out of a switchblade. I mean, I don't know. That is not me. My poor wife will find things on the devil's playground that is Pinterest and say, let's do this project. And it's just, it's God's way of keeping me humble because I just, I, I've got to say, do you know who I am? She's, she's found this coffee table. She wants a new coffee table. She's like, hey, look at this coffee table. It's super easy. It's only 200 bucks. Here's the reality. If I try to build said coffee table, it will cost me 1200 bucks and I still won't have a coffee table. I can't do it. Just not handy. But for a long time, she and I have talked about wanting some type of custom bookshelves, like built-ins, in our home office. She wants it to be a place that I can go and work. You know, we have four kids, so the office becomes the catch-all. It's right when you walk in the door. So we looked at, like, you know, custom-built uh, bookshelf, crazy expensive. You go buy them at Walmart, they inevitably fall apart because that's where we were. We had, you know, cheap bookshelves that were falling over. And so one day I get this text message from my wife that says, I found these shelves. Do you think you can do them? <laughs> Thanks for keeping me humble. But these were, it wasn't like a bookshelf. These were, were floor to ceiling shelves. It's a two by 12 board, like nine and a half feet long. That's the length of the wall. And it, there were five of them going up the wall. And for some absurd reason, I said, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and so we went, we bought this wood at Lowe's and then we stained it. And then I, I went to work and so I cut these little side braces, and I even angle cut them, ooh, right? And, and I, I mounted them to the wall, and they stuck, whoa. And so I did 10 of them, boom, 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 right, five shelves. And then I get the boards, and I place them on top, and they were cut to the right length. Got to admit, Lowe's cut them, but anyways. And so, <laughs> and, and then I, I, you know, I attach the shelves to the braces, and five of them go up, and they're all there, and then we start putting stuff on the shelves, like books and knickknacks, and everything stays, and nothing falls. I did it. I built five shelves, right? You should clap for that. But this is why I'm telling the story. 
I have failed at every home project I have ever attempted, but this one. So anytime someone comes over, a few, a few weeks ago, not too long after I built the shelves, we had Pastor Marshall and his wife Kathy over for dinner, and they walk into our house, and like Marshall's trying to go to the kitchen, I like grab him by the arm, I'm like, hey, check this out, man. You see those shelves? I built them. You ever need any shelves? You know anybody who needs shelves? It's my new ministry. Why? Why? Because, because I did build them. I, I say all, I don't have time for all that. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are God's bookshelves. We're the workmanship, the craftsmanship. He's put his all into your design, and he did it for a purpose. For we are his workmanship, created by him for good works that he prepared beforehand. Do you know what that means? The, the, the standing up in obedience should not be laborious because you should understand what it means that God said, Omar, Lenny, Lisa, Louie, Michelle, I, I've got some things I designed just for you. I, I've got some stuff that I prepared long before you were ever a thought. And I prepared it for you to accomplish for me. You know, the story today that, that God would, would design this plan for this woman who has a junior high boy that she would say, if your friends spend the night, that's fine, but they got to come to church. That that work, that little, small, seemingly insignificant work would happen, and now there's a young man who serves faithfully in ministry, and his family tree's been altered. Works prepared beforehand, but they only get realized when we stand up for Jesus. Beloved, our positional identity, I know that's theological, this is what it means. Because of Jesus, I have a new identity. So when, when, here's the deal, because of, when, I am, when I am struggling with my sin, you know what? God approves of me. He doesn't approve of my sin, he approves of me. Well, why is that, Chris? Because of the finished work of Jesus. His work is finished. And so when he sees me struggling with sin, he approves of me because it's about Jesus. When I am preaching or reading the Bible or sharing my faith and he looks at me, he approves of me, not because I'm preaching and reading and sharing. He approves of me then for the same reason, because of the finished work of Jesus. So I can't brag about being so good, and the devil can't tell me I'm not good enough. But here's the deal. My positional identity has created a purposeful reality. I have been saved on purpose for a purpose. You will, ne beloved, you will never be one if you will not stand up in obedience for Jesus. And if you will never stand up, you will never experience life to the fullest that Jesus died for you to have. At some point in time, we have got to stand up. Here's the last thing. We're going to be one. We've got we to stir up our affections. We've got to stand up in obedience. we also got to speak up. We, we will at some point in time have to speak up. And a lot of this will be covered next week, and I don't have a lot of time, but this is what I'm getting at. We see in verse 31 of Ezekiel 22, God says, So I have poured out my indignation on them and consumed them with the fire of my fury. I have brought their conduct down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Because he found none, there was a declaration. And the tension of God's sovereignty and human responsibility, there are things I don't understand. But he found no one. And so destruction was the declaration. I will admit I am not a good enough theologian to reconcile all the Old Testament realities with New Testament living. I will say this, though. I do believe that God still surveys the land at times looking for someone. And when he finds no one, I still believe God will turn over communities and peoples and lands to their sin. And I believe he surveys the Rio Grande Valley looking for one to stir up their affections, to stand up in obedience, but also to speak up. If you do all these things for God and never speak of him, one without the other doesn't work. If you only speak of God and never do acts of obedience, one without the other doesn't work. And today there are people that don't know Jesus. Their trajectory of life 
is eternal separation. The Bible is clear. There is enough evidence of God in creation to condemn people. Romans 1. No one will ever stand before God when they leave this life and say, well, I just didn't know. Because Romans 1 tells us there's the sunset and the sunrise. There is the work of creation. But the sad news is creation is only enough evidence of God to condemn people. But when, when you and I will be one and stir up and stand up but then speak up, there's still a declaration from God, but it doesn't have to be destruction. Again, I can't save anyone, but I can speak up and tell people. And when I tell people, the Holy Spirit draws people. And when the Holy Spirit draws people, there is yet again a choice to accept or reject. But every time someone accepts, the declaration goes from destruction to life, from defeat to victory. But it involves speaking up. Many of us love this quote. For, we attribute it to St. Francis. I don't know that I actually think he said it. But anyways, and many of you could finish it. It goes something like this. Preach the gospel as you go or preach the gospel at all times and what? Use words if, ne- like, okay, four people knew it. All right, so, this is, so everybody's on the same page. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words when necessary. And sadly, that gets spoken and people say amen and you shouldn't because it may sound awesome, but it is theologically awful. Well, feed the poor. Use food if necessary. I'm going to go down to the food pantry after I eat a steak dinner. I'm going to stand in front of all the hungry people and say, I am full and I hope my fullness satisfies you. <laughs> or, or I'm not going to say anything, actually. I'm just, just going to stand there full, like, whoa, I ate too much, oh, you know. It doesn't work. Do we live lives of obedience? Yes. Can they be a part of our witness and testimony? Yes. But you will never live someone to Jesus. But you can tell them. Romans 10, 14, Paul says, how are people ever going to get saved if they're not going to hear? How will they ever hear if people don't preach? How will they be preachers if people aren't sent? Here's the good news. God is sending you. You've got to speak up. I've got to speak up. And I understand right now some of us are thinking, well, you know what? This sounds good, and I'm kind of inspired, and I'm, and I'm motivated. But, but I, I, I just, even if I want to be one, what difference will it make? I mean, I got this checkered past. I'm too young to matter. I'm too old to matter. I'm too this. I'm too that. You're right. You may be too all of that. But when we will be one for Jesus, stirring up, standing up, and speaking up, the, the, the possibilities become limitless because it's no longer about how good we are. It's about who he is. So some of you right now, Satan's in your ear chirping, saying, well, it doesn't even really matter because you are of no use in this kingdom. Well, let me me wrap this up and let me tell you a a little story that Jesus, see, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus was talking about this guy named John the Baptist, pretty well-known guy. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, uh, Jesus says this, he says, I'm telling you the truth. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, side note, that's everyone, right? So... Among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. What's he saying? That's the sickest dude ever. Translation, he's the greatest prophet. Ezekiel, Daniel, Elijah, Elisha, he's the best. Of men born of, of anyone born of women, there's been no one like my boy John the Baptist. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What in the world is Jesus saying? Is he saying that John the Baptist actually isn't that great? Is he saying that John the Baptist isn't in the kingdom? No, this is is what Jesus is saying. We know that Jesus ushered in this new language of the kingdom. And it was specific, not just to those who are in heaven, because John the Baptist is in heaven, but, but it's specific to his coming and the accomplishment of redemption and the sending of the Holy Spirit. It's this New Testament kingdom perspective. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, look, y'all heard of John the Baptist. That guy was legit. In fact, when it, when it comes to guys like that, there's not anyone better. And he says, but the least in the kingdom, the least of those who will respond with me can do greater things. Mathematically, this is how it works. Someone in this room is the least. Like you're, you're sitting there right now. You're like, man, I'm not very good at this, that. I, I think I might be the least. God may be in heaven like, yeah, bing, bing, bing. You're the least. That's you. Maybe it's me. 
But guess what? It doesn't matter anymore. Because in the economy of God, it doesn't matter if I'm the least. You, do you know why Jesus said that the least in the kingdom can do greater things than John, can be greater than John? Because when we trust Jesus, we have access to something that John never had access to in this life. Because when you receive Jesus as your Savior, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you are filled with his fullness and his power, and it's a permanent dwelling. So you can be too young, too old, not smart enough, too smart. This color, that color, this wealth, poor, doesn't matter. Because when you will stir up and stand up and speak up, it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. And with God, all things are possible. The question is, as he surveys the land, will he find anyone? This is where it's really personal because the question is not about what will we do, it's about what will you do. Will you be one? Again, Chris, it sounds good. What does it mean? It's simple. You choose to love God with all your heart. The great commandment precedes the great commission. It means you make time for him just like you would any other relationship. You pursue him in prayer and in the word. What you do outside of this room matches who you are inside the room. You partner, right? You, 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 you connect with the church. You step out. And you will fail miserably sometimes. You will fall down, but you can fall down saying, I'm trying to be the one. And so I'm going to change the script a little bit as we get ready to worship. I'm going to ask our ministers to start coming forward. And as we, as we get ready to have a time of invitation, here's the deal. I believe there are a lot of people, maybe in this room, maybe you're in overflow. I believe there are a lot of people, and you would say this, Chris, I know Jesus has saved me. I know I responded. I may not remember the day, but I know that I am secure when it comes to salvation. I have had that moment, but I also know that I have not been faithful. I know that, that I, I've, I've shared my affections. I've made work. I've, I've made family. I've made something else the priority and maybe you would say, I know I'm saved, but today I, I want to make a declaration to say, I want to be one. I want to be one starting today, forgetting what lies behind me, pressing on towards what's in front of me. And so here's the deal. You know, it's stir up, stand up, and speak up, right? If you would say today, I know that I know Jesus. I know I'm saved. But starting today, I want to start a different course of being one for him. I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. If that's you, you say, yeah, I want to be one. That's what I want to pursue. Would you stand up right where you are right now? Amen. As you stand, I want to pray over you. Father, for all those standing right now saying, I know that I have received the blood of Jesus. I've been saved, but I also know that at some point in time or Maybe time and time again, I've, I've shared affections and I've lost sight and I've changed course. But today, at least for today, I want to be one. Today, I, I want to stir up my, my love for the Lord. God, what I am praying is that for every individual standing and those that were unable to stand that, that feel the same way, God, what I am saying and I am praying is that you would put inside the hearts of these men and women the conviction to leave here in a few moments to make the decision to love you. That, God, when you survey the land, you would find one for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Here in just a moment, you'll be invited to come forward if you want to pray at this altar or pray with any of these ministers. But there's something else I want to do because here's the reality. Being one for Jesus, it begins with, with knowing Jesus. You, you can't be one until you are one. You've got to know him. And this is, this is nothing to do with religion. I really want to be clear. This is knowing in your heart. You may not know the day. You may, you may not know how old you were exactly. But you know in your heart that you have entered a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just that you're kind of certain, but you know. You see, the funny thing about knowing Jesus is that it comes with, according to John, assurance. And so if you're sitting there or you're in overflow and you're thinking to yourself, but I, I kind of think maybe I would go to heaven. I, I, I kind of think I'm okay. But you are uncertain. Or if you're saying, I have no idea. 
I got no idea what's in front of me for eternity. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it works out, but I just, I, I really am not sure. Beloved, hear me. Today, you can be sure. You can start the trajectory that positions you to be one. But it will only happen when you surrender your life for his and you trust him to save you. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do something bold and it's a little uncomfortable. But if you're here in the worship center or if you are in overflow and your statement is, I, I don't know that I know Jesus today. I, I, just, I just don't know. If that's your statement, but you would want to know today, you would want to know that you know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. And I know that it's asking maybe a lot. I could have you bow your head and close you. I could do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm saying if you are uncertain where you stand with Jesus and you want to leave today with the certainty of salvation, would you be willing to stand up and just say, I'm saying today I want to know. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Well, we're, we're going to have a time of response. I would ask any of our ministers, we have some standing, if you would. They're just going to pray with you. Someone, there's a few right over here. I see two. So ready, go. Somebody go over here. Just pray. Just Bring them, bring them forward. Thank you so much for being willing to stand. Can we give them some applause? And if you were standing, I didn't see you, I'd invite you to come forward. I'm going to ask everyone to stand now. And I don't know what the Lord has for you, but I'm just going to ask for the next few moments as we as we worship and we ask him to speak over us, that you would be willing to be obedient. Would you choose right now in this time of invitation to be one who's willing to be used? If he calls you forward, would you come? There's many available to pray with you. You can still, you can still trust Jesus. And so, Father, this time is yours. Would you have your way? Would you move in our hearts? Would you be glorified? And, Father, would today be the day of salvation for your glory? It's in Jesus' name.